Um, Sally, at the moment, I'm getting that host is disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, I'm sorry. I always forget to change that. Very sorry. Try again? Yep, go ahead. Um, Sally, if, can you see this just to make sure? We're seeing your screen. Good. So today, All Things Deck is the Maynard Public Library virtual event. Uh, these are excerpts from articles that were published in the Beacon Village year from November 2019 to March 2020. They are all posted at Maynard Life Outdoors. So you can go back and read uh, what I'm doing excerpts from. So the rise and fall of Digital Equipment Corporation, often referred to digital or deck, was a 41 year arc that started with a bit of rented space in the mill buildings in July 1957, peaked in size and sales in 1990 with the mill complex being the world headquarters of a 125,000 employee empire that reached 14 billion in annual sales. Then as a result of management and technology mishaps, repeatedly downsized at a fire sale of assets and was finally sold to Compact Corporation in 1998. So we're getting ahead to the logo, but we'll back up to how we got there. In the beginning, there was the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Kenneth Ken Olson, born in 1926, had done a stint in the Navy right out of high school. Oh, that was during the war, he had not served overseas, then attended MIT as an undergraduate, and then as a graduate student. Completed a master's degree in electrical engineering in 1952. Then and now, this is a study of electrical engineering and computing. After graduating, Olson moved to Lincoln. We took a job at Lincoln Laboratory, an MIT affiliated facility focusing on military research. It was in Lincoln Labs that the first transitions were being made from test to vacuum tubes to transistor based computers. Olson oversaw the development of a machine called the TX0. Much of the design improved was incorporated DEC's first computers. It was a DEC that the crucial first steps were taken for commercializing real time computing of having a keyboard and a video screen. It's a bit of a fuzzy picture, but some of you will re recognize this as building 12 and the digital sign over what was then the entrance. May, 1957, Olson and Harlan Anderson, a colleague at Lincoln Labs, approached a venture capitalist company with a proposal. They got an investment of $70,000 for a 70% share in the company. Outrageous then, outrageous now, but there wasn't much of a history of there being venture capital companies. Um, and um, they didn't really feel they were going to be able to negotiate, so that was the deal they took. There was pushback from the investors about having computer in the name because in most people's minds, being a computers were large, expensive, and mostly unprofitable. Think IBM, Univac, hence the name became Digital Equipment Corporation. As soon as they had the money, they came out in July of 1957, shopping for a space to set up their business. After a few visits, they signed a three-year lease um, for 8,680 square feet at $300 a month. They and Stan Olson, Ken's younger brother, who was employee number three, spent weekends painting the space themselves. They also went to Gruber Brothers Furniture and bought $69 worth of furniture on 30 days credit. For the first three years, and again, you have to remember they were profitable from the first year onward, they were producing electronic test mod modules for engineering labor laboratories. But in effect, if you're developing a machine to test computers, you're developing a computer. They just weren't calling it that. By October 1961, so within four years, the company had grown to 265 employees and annual sales were approaching $6 million. There's a great personal story about how Ken Olson pursued his wife. On vacation from graduate school and visiting his parents in Connecticut, he was smitten with a woman, Aliki, excuse me, Oliki Valve from Finland, who was visiting the neighbors. 
nothing came of it at the time, but after she returned to Finland and he to MIT, he could not stop thinking about her. Olson wrote a letter asking if he might visit. Her reply, don't bother. Not taking no for an answer, he left MIT, took a leave from graduate school, took a ship to Europe, bicycled to Denmark, ferried to Sweden, where he got as a job as an electrician at a Swedish ball bearing factory. The journey to Sweden was not entirely crazy. It was mostly crazy, but not entirely crazy. His mother's parents had come from Sweden. His father's from Norway, so it was possible he still had family relatives living there. Once settled in, he wrote Oliki again. This time, she agreed to see him. Olsen quit his job, traveled to Finland, arrived at Oliki's parents' home, and immediately proposed marriage. The response was no from both Oliki and her parents. Did he return to the U.S. crestfallen? No. He continued to court Oliki. After two months, the answer became yes. They married in Finland December 12, 1950, then returned to Massachusetts where he completed his graduate degree. So the, although the Olsons lived in Lincoln their entire lives, there are many mentions of Oliki and their three children visiting Ken at the mill. She died in 2009 after 59 years of marriage, Ken two years later. Among the many stories Ken Olson told about the early years was how primitive the working conditions were. In the depths of winter, heat was constantly on, but in the spring and fall, heat was not provided on the weekends. Raytheon shared one building with deck space. If Raytheon wanted heat, digital got heat. Raytheon would call noon on Friday to specify which buildings it wanted heated, paying $15 an hour for the service. Ken Olson would call at one o'clock to see if he was going to get free heat for the weekend. The PDP-1 pictured here was DEC's first computer introduced in December 1959. First delivery to a customer was November 1960. It introduced the concept of real-time computing. It weighed around 1,600 pounds, was sold for $30,000, the equivalent of about $270,000 in inflation-adjusted dollars and was considered a huge bargain compared to mainframe computers. DEX sold a total of 53 of them. As to where PDP came from, digital already being in the equipment business rather than the computer business, decided to call its first model a programmed data processor, hence PDP-1. The PDP-8 was introduced in 1965, and if you're looking at this, what you're seeing is on the far left side, uh, paper spools and paper drives ranged vertically. On the right top, racks for where the paper drives will sit when they're being hooked up, and the processor is sort of to the lower right. And this was um, the model of the PDP-8. It became DEC's first superstar, super selling computer, selling more than 50,000 over its lifespan. The innovative idea radical at the time was to make a smaller, cost-effective computer rather than going for bigger is better. There have been missteps prior. PDP models four through seven were sluggish sellers and the PDP six in particular um, had devoured huge amounts of the company's research and development budget to no success. The eight supported time sharing um, and allowed people to get the, the real-time response they were expected if they were using a computer by themselves even though multiple people were using the computer at the same time. The introductory price was $18,500, equivalent to $150,000 in today's dollars. So again, we're seeing a more powerful computer, faster computer at a lower price. This continued to spawn models that were um, smaller and faster. One anecdote at the time was that Bob Metcalf, at that time a graduate student at MIT, had received permission to have a PDP-8 on loan in his office for weekend demonstration for visiting high school students. When he got to his office that Saturday, the computer was gone. Dex's public relations department turned the crime into an advertising coup, describing the PDP-8 as the first computer small enough to steal. Metcalf went on to co-invent the Ethernet, parent concept for the internet. Financially, major milestones were achieved when the company went public in 1966 raising a bid over $8 million for a 20% share of the company. The PDP-11, uh, and now still with paper drives, 
reached the market in 1970. DEC had ended up behind the competition, behind IBM and Data General, the later had been started in Hudson by ex-DEC engineers. So DEC bet the farm on leapfrogging the competition. It succeeded. Various versions of the PDP-11 family sold more than 600,000 mini computers to all corners of the world. So Harlan Anderson, co-founder, employee number two, left the company in 1966, just before the company went public. Anderson's taken his departure. And here's a photo of um, Ken and Harlan Anderson together. His take, in a memoir he published in 2009, described the problem as a major difference in his and Olson's visions for how to manage the fast growing company. Anderson favored a traditional hierarchy. Olson, having put in a bit over a year in Poughkeepsie, New York, as MIT's liaison to IBM, loathed this type of rigidity. He went on to commit to a matrix-style management that perplexed business school academics for years, yet seemed to work fine for a company of engineers making leaded end projects for other engineers. DEC dominated the mini-computer niche. In 1971, Massachusetts Governor Francis William Sargent declared Maynard as mini computer capital of the world. By then, DEC had expanded to renting most of the mill space. A year later, it bought the 60-acre Parker Street Industrial Complex. In 1974, it bought the entire mill complex, and in time, other buildings in town bringing the total to more than 2 million square feet of office and factory space in Maynard. Exact numbers are not available, but estimates are that digital employed between one-third and one-half of adults living in Maynard. Students were hired right out of high school. Um, other employees commuted. Routes 117 and 20 said they had twice daily traffic jams and the mill pond was partially filled in to create more parking. Evenings, restaurants and bars were flooded with employees. There were no empty storefronts. So now we see a VAX. VAX was digital's second act in the mini computer business. The name of change choice itself was significant as after almost 20 years of PDP next number, this was a whole new system. The acronym stood for Virtual Address Extension. Design and development started in 1975. The VAX 11780 you see here in the image was introduced in October 1977. In non-tech speak, the VAX computer systems were flexible, robust, and scalable. As the customer's information technology grew, more VAX machines could be added and networked through new means, the Ethernet. New VAX models were introduced well into the early 1990s, but everything remained compatible. The success of VAX catapulted DEC into higher and higher income levels. A billion dollar sales for 1977, then four billion for 1982, 11.4 billion for 1988. DEC's market capitalization, numbers of shares times price per share, reached a peak of $24 billion in 1987. The company was riding the peak of the bet for farm introduction of the VAX based mini computers a decade earlier. Even though it had stumbled badly in beginnings of the microcomputer era, DEC had a valid claim to being the second largest computer company in the world. What DEC did not see coming were changes embodied by a famous quote by Georges Doriot. Dorio being the person who uh, headed up the venture capital company that lent them the original money. What Dorio said is someone somewhere is making a product that will make your product obsolete. Hmm. Oh, very unofficially, there was a certain amount of hubris around DEC in the 1980s. It finished with the punchline, this isn't Burger King and you don't get it your way. You get it our way and not at all because we're digital and you're not. Um, we're going to segue into uh, the interesting situation of women and minorities of all sorts being hired by digital. Women were not rare at digital. From pursuing a list of the first 100 full-time employees, 36 were women. Years later, the main reasons Olson gave for locating the Maynard were low rent for the space and a local workforce with lots of factory experience. Many of the women were walk-to-work Maynardites. Some who had worked in the same buildings in the woolen mill era, which had shut down around 1950. 
the newly refurbished work areas were clean, quiet, and well lit, and um, very nicely did not smell of sheep. Alma E. Ponce was the first woman hired. She was employee number five. She had already put in 25 years in the wool business before Olson hired her as the first administrative assistant. She stayed with Deck until she retired 21 years later. Gloria Peraza was the first woman hired to work in assembling laboratory modules and system modules. She was employee number six. These products allowed Deck to be digital, excuse me, digital to be profitable from its first year onward. According to Peter Koch, plant manager, Peraza stayed with the company for 25 years, rising to the level of production manager. The 50 to 60 women who worked for her in assembly were informally known as Gloria's girls. They were responsible for inserting electronic components into the circuit boards, welds, and doing quality control. Ken Olson was known to drop in for coffee and a chat with Gloria to keep abreast of any production problems. Well, why women? Because it was no longer legal to hire children. If you look at this note under light assembly workers, the request was for girls and women with good eyesight and nimble fingers. Some of the women worked the mother shift, meaning that their day ended in time for them to be home by the time their kids got home from school. And here's a shot of one of the workspaces with the women well spaced out, all in their smocks and working on assembly. Digital was not adverse to hiring women with technological expertise. But some of the customers had a hard time adapting. Olson had gone to MIT campus to interview students in 1960. One result was the hiring of Barbara Stephenson in 1961. From Barbara, I was the first woman engineer at DEC and her badge number was number 71. Customers would call for an applications engineer. They would say, I want to speak with an engineer. And I would reply, I'm an engineer. And they'd say, no, I want to speak to a real engineer. So I developed this pattern according to Barbara. Well, tell me, let me tell you about the application you have in mind. We have three lines of modules ranging from five to 10 mega cycles. And she said the line would often go dead for a moment. And then she sort of hear in the background, Joe, guess what? I've got a woman engineer on the phone. Women were promoted from within. Roseanne Giordano was hired from Xerox in 1979 to work in marketing, promoted the manager in 1981, then promoted in 1984 to become the first woman vice president and corporate officer at Digital Equipment Corporation. Earlier, Maynard resident Angela Cosette was hired administrative assistant in 1963 in support of DECUS User Society. That was known as DECUS, D-E-C-U-S. DECUS provided a pre-internet forum for computer users to exchange technological information and user-developed software. Cosette moved up to be company, become the company's first woman manager in time with as many as 100 people reporting to her. In her own words, Digital became very aggressive about giving women the opportunity to grow in their careers and making it possible for the men move into key positions. Digital's core commitment to growing, we made a core commitment to growing beyond being a white male dominated technology company and moved into higher gear with the hiring of John Sims as manager of affirmative action and equal employment opportunity in 1974. He rose to become vice president of corporate personnel in 1984. In a 1986 interview for US Black Engineer, Sims explained, very early on, we recognized that there were not enough minorities and women flowing into technological technical careers. The company started programs in scores of high schools and junior colleges with equipment, gifts, and funding. The company also deliberately located manufacturing plants in Black and Hispanic neighborhoods and trained staff there to qualify for promotion to management. This quote I'm about to read came from Deborah Pace, who had been an employee at the Springfield facility. And this is from a collection of quotation tributes compiled by Gordon College in 2006. I want to thank Mr. Olson and his family for providing people in the Black community with excellent job opportunities corporate training, and other great skills that were ahead of so many other Fortune 500 companies. Because of Mr. Olson, his brother, and their passion to bringing Digital Equipment Corporation into the world, a vision that helped others to dream and realize their potential. I was able to work, purchase my first home, take care of my two daughters, finish my college education, and gain skills that will utilize the remainder of my life. Deck will always be a part of my life and memory. I would love to work for him again. I salute the leader, hero, and great visionary man, 
today and always. Barbara Walker, an African-American lawyer with years of experience as director of Office of Civil Rights in the federal government, joined DEC in 1979. She started core groups as monthly meetings at the senior management level, later expanded downward across the entire company with the premise that affirmative action is for everyone. Walker's training program began with self-assessment of one's own stereotypes. Workshop participants were expected to build relationships with people they felt they were different from. And they were expected to be, people were expected to talk about how they felt victimized by those perceptions. These groups of seven to nine people met on company time, several hours per month to discuss the different expectations of people who are racial minorities, where women were people from different countries of different religious beliefs, or with people who were other than heterosexual orientation. Barbara Walker went on to develop a Valuing Differences program, which is one of the chapters in this book, Diversity in the Workplace. This evolved from the core groups and the call for employees to acknowledge differences rather than pretending they did not exist. One of the tools was a mock questionnaire that inverted questions so frequently asked of homosexuals. For example, is it possible that heterosexuality is just a phase that you might grow out of. A New York Times article from 1991 mentioned that the US Labor Department had praised only three large companies for commitment to affirmative action. Those were Persecutive, excuse me, Pacific Gas and Electric, IBM, and DEC. Digital had zero tolerance uh, towards any discrimination towards gays and provided for internal gay support groups. This was in addition to the Diversity Differences Core Group. Support groups were also encouraged for women. Managers who violated anti-discrimination policies were terminated. Were these benefits for DEC quantifiable? Was there a benefit back to the company for making this tremendous effort to support people who didn't fit you know, the standard tech concept? DEC gained a reputation as a good workplace for minorities and women. The company attracted top talent and the staff turner, turnover was below national norms. All employees felt empowered to identify problems and propose solutions. This fit, fit well with a DEC mantra, he who proposes does, meaning that a person identifying a problem was often charged with putting together a team to fix it. Clearly, it came to, to encompass they who propose does, they being a singular pronoun covering all gender choices. So here's a shot of Ken out in front of the sign on um, Main Street. Uh, the, car, the, excuse me, the granite block is still there on the ground. It, it used to say Clock Tower Place for a while. Um, I think it's now Mill and Main. Ken Olson was a busy man. Here he is at one of the annual blood donations, um, sort of multitasking, reading notes while he's donating blood. The company also put out digital this week and a digital dictionary, um, you know, to provide text speak so people could understand what digital was. You were supposed to learn what digital was. They were not supposed to explain things to you. Also was, now here's a point. This quote, this quote. Olson was, Olson was correctly quoted, but misunderstood when a talk given in to a 1977 World Future Society meeting in Boston, he said, there's no reason for any individual to have a computer in their home. This statement was repeated in Time Magazine and elsewhere. You have to keep in mind that the first non-hobbyist personal computers, including the Apple II, were just reaching the market in 1977. The IBM PC showed up in 1991. Ken's point. He knew that computers were evolving so rapidly that any purchased home computer would soon become obsolete. In his mind, the proper solution was to have a video screen, a keyboard, and a printer in the home, and that these, these would be all hooked up electronically to company-operated computers that would provide the software, software upgrades, and memory storage. DEC actually launched the first what became a series of video terminals in 1978, as the VT100, superseded in time by the VT200 and the VT300. The VT series sold millions. And you have to realize that DEC had committed itself to selling mini computers 
that generated significant profits by customizing software and providing service. A leap to also making low-priced, low-profit, small computers that would run software provided by other companies um, didn't help IBM, but DEC was stymied by this concept. Only after IBM launched its personal computers in 1981 did DEC decide to enter the fray. It initiated not one, not two, but three separate PC projects at separate company facilities with poor, poor communication among them. DEC's standard procedure would have been to then decide which was, which was best and kill the other two. Instead, all three were brought to market, perhaps overly fast in 1982. So you had the high-end professional, the DECMATE series, which offered only word processing, competing say with Wang, and the more general purpose Rainbow 100. DEC being DEC, everything was of high quality and ran various versions of DEC software, but not being open to the flood of software that IBM was allowing other companies to make and run on its machines. DEC failed to set the standard and it failed to follow the standard. Even for something as simple as floppy disks, DEC used its own proprietary formatting. Disks formatted to the IBM standard worked on IBM machines and IBM clones, but not DEC machines and vice versa. And as a consequence of poor internal communications and DEC's bias towards proprietary systems, its own three microcomputers were not compatible with each other. So this is a digital VT100. You sort of recognize the layout of the, of the, the keyboard, the screen, um, but it's not, a, it's not a computer. Okay, I've leapt ahead there, so let's back up. A couple of years later, we're still on the PC story. A proposal emerged from engineering to start over, but this time with competitively priced clones of the IBM system, able to run all the software that was making IBM's PC so successful for business applications. Some of you remember things like Lotus Notes or Lotus uh, and DBase. Compaq had also jumped in this niche with the Compaq Despro and Dell followed with the Turbo BC. These are being priced at around $1,000. Ken Olson killed the proposal. His attitude had always been that DEC was a leader, not a follower. At the time Olson reversed himself on this topic in 1991, it was too late. DEC brought out a series of high-end, extremely reliable IBM compatible machines under the Prioris, Celebris, and Venturis brands, but Compact, Dell, Gateway, and others had a much larger share of what was transitioning to a low profit margin business. When merger talks first started with Compact in 1996, digital was manufacturing about 1 million PCs a year. Compact was by itself was doing 12 times that number. Okay, another detour. The Digital Federal Credit Union, which goes by DCU, had its beginnings in 1979, when DEC was in the process of transferring people from Maynard to a new facility in Westminster, about 30 miles away. Complaints got back to Ken that people were having a hard time getting house mortgages. After discussions with human resources, a decision was made to create a credit union that would charge less than the going rate for home loans and pay better interest on savings. Interestingly, this echoed services that the woolen mill had offered under the Maynard family during the 19th century. Back then, there was no bank in Maynard. Employees could earn interest by creating accounts funded by money deducted from their pay. DCU has outlived DEC um, by 21 years. The headquarters are Marlboro. It's the largest credit union in New England and has assets in excess of $8 billion. Per DCU's website, the credit union is a member-owned financial cooperative providing financial banking services to multiple member groups, primarily communications and utilities employees. Membership is also open to immediate families of current members. Um, I'll say myself that many, many years ago I was waxing, working for Baxter Healthcare Corporation, and I'm still a member of Baxter Credit Union, which I think at one point either had my house mortgage or a home equity loan. And my daughter has her account with Baxter Credit Union. So these things can carry on and on and on. Aha, now let's talk a bit about Deck World and Deck Airlines. Deck World had started as Deck Town in 1982, which was an annual convention for employees, primarily for the sales force, to be made familiar with the year's innovations and new product introductions. In 1987, it made the transition, it made the transition from Deck Town to Deck World 
opening up not just to employees, but also to valued customers. 1987, the event brought 42,000 people to Boston. Just weeks before the September opening day, senior management realized they had underestimated the housing demand and that all hotels in Boston were 100% booked. The solution, Jack Shields, marketing senior vice president, proposed chartering ships. Why not? Deck contracted to have the Queen Mary II and the Starship Oceanic, also known as the Big Red Boat, docked at Boston for the duration of the convention. The entire event cost Deck an estimated $20 million, but generated close to a billion dollars in product orders and service contracts. Deck World 1988 was held in Cannes, France. Two years later, the company split the event. Deck World in July in Boston, followed by Deck Ville in Cannes in, in September. Deck World 1992 was newsworthy on two accounts, being the last ever of these conventions, and Bill Gates, CEO at that time of Microsoft, as a keynote speaker. Gates was there to expand on how a newly forged deal to combine Dex mini computers and Microsoft software was going to benefit both companies. He went off script. Gates then basically talked about himself, or rather he talked about his brand new 60,000 square foot house he had built that incorporated software into running everything. The message was not subtle. According to Gates, software rules, and he was the emperor of software, and he was right on both counts. Today, Microsoft's current capitalization stands in excess of $1 trillion. Ken Olson, who at that time was the emperor of hardware, president of the second largest computing company in the world, was forced to design just a few months later. The company downsized for six years, then sold what remained, sold what remained a compact for $9.6 billion. Now, although never actually called the DEC Air Force. DEC had a fleet of helicopters that regularly flew routes uh, to nearby facilities, and also the digital's own gate at Boston's Logan International Airport. The landing pad in Mannard was at the rear of the uh, Parker Street complex. From an article by Jack Farley, the helicopters were not an executive perk at DEC. They were used by any and all employees who wanted to avoid traffic and going from place to place. This egalitarian policy further emphasized just how different DEC was and how indifferent they appeared to be to the cost of anything. In doing the case study, we were told that DEC had state-of-the-art video conferencing facilities and that no one used them because it was just sexier to take the helicopters. In addition to his own hired Air Force, helicopters and corporate jets, Ken Olson was himself a certified pilot. He owned his own plane and at times flew himself to Woods Meeting, which were senior management retreats in Maine and New Hampshire, a thought that surely worried the rest of the senior management at Digital. The solution was not to plead for him to stop flying, but rather to insist that he have a professional as a co-pilot. So if you were back in the beginning, you may have recognized that DEC logo, uh, logo in the uh, left corner. Over its 41 years, Digital Equipment Corporation went through a number of logo changes, some obvious, some subtle. The original from 1957 was the stacked three letters. The second version, um, which came to blue later, but was showing that as such, and let's go back. We can see there um, a black and white version of it, the block version. And they actually tested this all capitals letter versions in the mid 60s and decided that was not deck. So it went back to the uh, lowercase letters. You notice the dots over the eyes were squares, were against a blue background. There are other subtleties in the letters I'll get to. But the point was, here we are with a logo worldwide recognizable. For a while, the different PDP models had each had their own color, but in the transition to VAX, many computers, everything scheduled to digital blue. And then it changed in 1987. The background color was changed to burgundy. At that time, the eye dots remained squares. The reason for abandoning blue is not really clearly uh, determinable, but one possibility was an intent to differentiate from Big Blue, the nickname for IBM that we, which had become popular in the media in the early 1980s. That name itself has an unclear origin, but is generally assumed to refer to the blue tint of their computers. So finally, in 1993, during the layoffs era, the deck logo underwent one, one more set of relatively subtle changes. Keep the burgundy, 
make the lines between the boxes black, turn the squares over the eyes to dots, um, put a little bit of slant at the tail of the G and the top of the T. Um, this did not save the company for its downward spiral. Okay, just as a sign, this is a, an example of a bond issued by digital. Uh, I was not able to find an image of a stock certificate, but I'm willing to assume it looks somewhat the same. If you notice the close up, we have a, a somewhat symbolic figure here of a gowned woman holding the world with a, I think what is a PDP 11 um, behind her. So there's Dex's uh, um, financial symbol. And an aerial shot um, taken from the west looking east shows the buildings that were there when Deck bought the place. Um, you'll see to the left side, the small parking lot that was created uh, and that's where the farmer's market are held. And then to the right side, the two large parking lots, um, the largest one representing the filling and shrinking of the pond from its, its earlier size. So in this full shot, um, I'm just gonna have to say giving the shadows somehow a, a late afternoon, perhaps on a Sunday, but no one's there. We get this shot taken from the other side and you can see the parking lots are really quite, quite, quite full. Um, another story goes that Ken used to occasionally stop off at Baba Co's for a, a breakfast and that people felt it was okay to approach him. So at one point, uh, one employee approached him and said, Ken, I ask you a question. He said, sure, sure. He says, what can we do about the parking problem? Because when I get here, uh, the parking lots are full and if I can find a space at all, it's all the way at the far side. And sometimes it's raining and, and it's, it's just an awfully long walk. Can we, can we get some more parking? And Ken Olson being an engineer, had an engineer solution. He said, well, what time does your shift start? The guy says, starts at eight. Ken says, I bet you if you got here at 7.30, you could find a parking space. The decline. Stumbles in the end that contributed Deck's decline and fall were many. A simplistic offered repeated stories that Deck declined to get into the personal computer business, but this was only a small part of the problem. Circa 1985, Deck decided to compete with commercial data centers, meaning it was going to go after IBM. It was looking up the mountain. This market traditionally belonged to IBM to compete would require a massive increase in staff involved in sales and services. The employee population increased by 27,000 people in two years. Deck was basically hiring an army. Around the same time, senior management decided that up upgraded VAC system would no longer support open architecture, making it difficult for manufacturers to add on components. At the same time, Deck decided that any purchase of a used Deck computer would require a fee to relicense the software that was already on the computer. Were these things profitable short-term? Yes. Were they making customers angry? Also, yes. The company was also strongly committed to vertical integration, meaning that it wanted to own its manufacture of all components, chips, screens, keyboards, disk drives, even when independent companies were manufacturing these same things for less. Competition in the mini computer area had, had gained. Sun Microsystem Data General competing head-to-head -head DEC failed in an attempt to compete with IBM in the mainframe. Um, there was the development and failure of the VAX 9000 mainframe, which chewed through some $3 billion of critically needed capital at this time. And while DEC was focusing upward at IBM, the microcomputer companies were approaching fast from below. DEC's crash was fast. The last year billion dollar profits was 1989. Total revenue continued to increase, but 1990 was only marginally profitable the subsequent years saw losses in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Restruction was rampant and continuous. People in senior management left. There were hiring freezes, followed by offerings of early retirement and generous, generous severance packages for those willing to volunteer to leave. The problem with offering packages like that is you can't pick and choose who leaves and who doesn't, so critical people were being lost. The layoffs began in earnest in January 1991, including in Maynard. All company operations, the mill building shut down in 1993, the Parker Street complex soon after. Company headquarters had previously been moved to a new building over in Padoma Road, 
later sold to Stratus Technologies, soon to become part of the Beijing Royal School. President Ken Olson, 65 years old in 1991, and the only president the company had had since its creation in 1957, was strongly against layoffs. From a May 1992 article in the New York Times, he said, we've lived through recessions, this is just one more. Four months later, the company's board of directors forced him to resign. For thousands of employees working for DEC, with, um, who were there within the empowered management system and the mantra, do the right thing, this was a heart-wrenching event. A forum comment from one employee, I used to drive to the office in the morning and I couldn't wait to get to work. I love my job and the company environment. The company doesn't love itself anymore. Now I drive to work in the morning and all I can think about is getting out of this company and doing something else. Robert Palmer, who had joined the company in 1985 to run the computer chip manufacturing division, took over as president, also taking on in time the title of chief executive officer and later chairman of the board. He was perceived as competent, but not visionary. Over six years, Palmer oversaw plant closings, staff relocations, layoffs of 60,000 employees, and sale of many of the major components of the company. Downsizing alone cost the company close to $5 billion to shutter facilities and to um, pay severance packages. Even during the decline, there had been successes. Digital had launched the internet search engine AltaVista in 1995. It was the most popular among the many competing search engines such as Lycos, Ask Jeeves, and Yahoo. According to sources, Larry Page and Sergey Brin had approached DEC in 1997 with their PageRank system, hoping to be acquired by AltaVista. Um, they were not, and they went on to start a company called Google. DEC was not alone in suffering setbacks and contractions in the 1990s. IBM shrank from 405,000 employees to 220,000 by 1994 and reduced its stock dividends by two thirds. Data General, Wang Laboratories, Prime Computer, Lotus Development Corporation, and Apollo Computer were all greater Boston area computer companies that faded and had folded or acquired around the same time. So after protracted negotiations, Compaq acquired, announced, in January 1998 that it was acquiring DEC. The deal closed in June for $9.6 billion. This for a company had once been valued at $24 billion. Was the sale inevitable? Perhaps not. With a different senior management, it is possible that DEC Digital could have survived, perhaps prospered, but unlikely it could have regained its aura as a radically innovative company attracting the best and the brightest. Instead, ex tech employees wanted to populate the next generation of tech companies. Okay, we're getting towards the end of this talk. June 17th, 2006, 14 years after Ken left DEC, an estimated 1,000 former employees participated in the salute to Ken Olson held at Gordon College, went in mass for a groundbreaking ceremony for a Ken Olson Science Center. Ken had been a Gordon College trustee since 1961. The town of Maine was represented by a board of selectmen. Ken died in 2011. His wife had preceded him by two years. They are buried in a modest plot in Lincoln Cemetery, Lincoln, Massachusetts. At the time of Ken's death, he was survived by two of his three children and five grandchildren. DEC had stopped all company operations in the mill buildings in 1993, not long after Sanford Parker Street. The headquarters have been relocated. In November 1994, Digital sold the mill to a newly formed private healthcare corporation called Franklin Life Care Corp. The price was 1.5 million. It was a fire sale. During DEC's last year, the town had assessed the value of the mill at 25 million and DEC's property taxes alone were $671,000. Franklin's plans were devised in a prospectus titled Mill Pond Village. The intent was to find commercial tenants for some of the buildings facing the mill pond. And the follow on was to create a massive senior living center that would encompass independent living, assisted living and nursing home. The project was to have up to 800 living units, dining rooms, craft rooms, a museum, a cafe overlooking the Asset River. However, funding never materialized. The mill complex stayed mostly vacant till Wellesley Rosemont Capital agreed to buy it in October 1997, closing the deal in 98. 
Clock Tower Place, their name for the facility, <clears throat> managed to fill the you know, buildings entirely <coughs> by the end of 2000. One reason they had a tax break from the town, which allowed them to charge below market rates. The town was revitalized, vacant storefronts were refilled, and the town was vibrant again. So after filling the existing buildings, Clock Tower was so optimistic that at one point it had proposed adding a new 300,000 square foot building on the south side of Mill Pond, plus a five-story parking garage for 1,500 cars. Then the business outlook changed. Three years into the recession that had started in 2008, the vacancy rate hover is hovering around 30%, with more departures expected. The death knell sounded when Monster.com relocated. This international job search company had moved to Clock Tower in 1998, expanded and expanded and expanded. Monster also had visible presence in town sponsoring blood drives and annual road race and other events. In early 2014, the company, which had already been downsizing, having missed the social media impact on job search that had fostered LinkedIn, relocated all of its remaining employees to Weston. With Monster gone, Wellesley Rosewood, i.e. Clock Tower, was facing less than 30% occupancy, a $50 million mortgage, and an expired tax break. CTP was put up for sale. The buyers in 2015 were Artemis Real Estate Partners and Saracen Properties, having bought the mortgage and acquired more funding. The mill complex was rebranded as Mill and Main, um, with on-site managers, some, some modest remodeling, extensive landscaping, uh, and town approved zoning changes allowing for some retail and restaurant opportunities uh, not quite yet realized. Heading toward Maine's 150th anniversary, Mill and Main continues to seek tenants for the building space and other options that could benefit it and the town. I do want to say that Dex Demise was not unique. Um, many other businesses were going out um, at, in, in tech, going out of business at the same time. Uh, we do have a local example of, again, a, a fast change going on because locally our now example is Acacia Communications. This company is headquartered in Maynard's Mill Complex. It started in 2009 where the same building space as DEC did back in 1957. Acacia expanded, expanded more, went public in 2016 with a valuation of several billion dollars, and then was acquired by Cisco Systems in 2019, a deal that would be completed in 2020. What the future holds for the mill's largest, mill complex's largest tenant is unknown. Will it grow in place or will Cisco force a relocation? I do want to say to close that for most of its history, Maynard has been a company town in the sense that survival and prosperity depended almost entirely on one company. For 100 years, that was wool. For almost 40 years, computers. And um, now we're back to having a uh, multiple client situation. And we're hoping that will leave some, um, create some stability for the town, but we also would be helpful if the mill complex was 100% rented. So there, we have traveled from 1957 to now. And I'm going to turn this back over to Sally, who will field questions. Thank you, David. Um, do we have any questions or comments? Um, feel free to unmute yourself. Or you can raise your hand or uh, write a question in the chat. This is Ron Willig. I just want to say thank you for your presentation. Welcome. Hi, this is John McNamara, a longtime DEC employee from 1968 to 1985. And I very, very much enjoyed your talk and, of course, reading your, your newspaper articles. Um, there was one little thing I wanted to add about uh, Ken Olson's early days. A lot of what he says, uh, there's st still available on the internet a number of Ken Olson talks, uh, should anybody miss, miss the old days. And one of the ones which has a nice little joke in it concerns his uh, pr presentation to ARD for the initial funding. And he said he told people that the business plan should promise profit within one or two years. He said, because most of the people on their board are over 70 or 80 years old. He says, so it, the profit better come quickly if you, want, if you want approval. So that was his comment. Thank you. 
please, people who work there have more information than me, please speak up. I'll speak up because I uh, remember uh, meeting John McNamara when I first heard of digital, which was at the MIT Model Railroad Club that featured a building that was labeled Digital Widget Works. And there were several members of that club uh, who worked for DEC. I worked for DEC myself as a secretary during school vacations. I was a school teacher at the time as part of the temporary assistance group, which was composed mostly of mothers of school-aged children who wanted the summers off, so it dovetailed nicely. The second summer that I worked for DEC was when the VAX was being designed and it was hush-hush top secret. And I remember writing verses to the Stars and Stripes forever uh, for an intramural softball game between the PDP-8 team, those were our opponents, and those of us on the Star Project, which was part of the what became the VAX. Um, and I was back there uh, a number of times thereafter. It was an interesting place to work, to put it mildly. Uh, years later, uh, my parents subsidized me and another brother with funds to get our first computers. At the advice of a digital employee, I did not buy a rainbow, although that was attractive. That was able to run CP. I think it was called CPM, which uh, was an operating system that had not yet become quite obsolete and also DOS. But on the advice of a deck company, I bought an original IBM PC instead and continued to write my dissertation on that. I had done some of the first word processing done on at digital on a newly designed mas machine based on the PDP-8 in the summer of 75 or 76. Uh, actually, the first word processing I did was on a deck system 10. Okay, Steve, Steve, I never saw. I, I'd like to leave some time for other people to have questions yeah. if we could. I'll be quiet. Hear me? Um. I'm trying to talk. I don't know if you hear me. Okay, yes. speak up a little bit, but yes. Okay. Identify yourself, please. Uh, uh, my name is Steve Klein. I'm a Y2K vet guy. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, they're from 67 through 93, uh, mostly in hardware services and whatever. Um, uh, a couple things that, uh, that I know represented a, uh, uh, a Lockheed uh, Corporation as a, one of our major, major customers. And in that environment, uh, there was a VAX workstation. It was highly profitable and highly sold. In fact, that chip was sold to other companies. I think HP maybe even produces it today. Uh, that and uh, the rumor on the, in the world was that DEC created the internet. It was called the ARPANET and it was used by the military. So I just wanted to get those things in. Thank you. All right, great. There's a question from Linda. I think Sally just went mute. Yes, I did. Sorry. Um, there's a question from Linda about um, what should we be archiving from this pandemic age? Um, what should we be collecting? You know, we think of things as ephemeral, but, and, and, and trust me, as, as an amateur historian, the first answer is save everything and then winnow it out later. But you, you can always kick yourself for not having kept something. Um, so masks, um, anything that, that's made with, that says something about the pandemic or say COVID-19, um, warning signs. I was at the Tobin Park and I saw someone that had taped a sign to a bench, said, before you sit down here, think of who else is sat down here and uh, whether they have the virus or not. I thought that's a little bit scary, but that's a, it's a comment on the time. Um, all right, so just again, as an amateur historian, keep first and, and, and uh, win a lot later. Uh, one, like more, to... one more story. 
Yeah, go uh, ahead. Yes, I'm Bob Lee. Uh, I started working for digital in New Jersey in 1982 and was there until early 1983. In the process, was moved by DEC uh, up to the Massachusetts area and worked in Littleton for quite some time. One of the stories of the DEC world area, the very late 80s, was about the uh, DEC had gone from vaxes to microvaxes. Uh, one of the popular models of microvaxes looked an awful lot like um, a humidifier or an electric heater on wheels. So the point where when they were setting up for one of the deck world shows, uh, some of the movers who were moving equipment in approached a deck employee and saying, I hope you don't mind, but we actually dropped one of your heaters. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's all. <laughs> okay. Um, there are several comments from Roger about the history of the company. Um, I just uh, encourage people to read those. They're um, long and technical. <laughs> um, I don't know if we can address them now, but it's, you know, it's, it's he's just naming the so many things that, that DEC did first or DEC did best. and. Um, and again, this is somewhat lost to history. Um, so he's talking about, you know, uh, just the various things the company did. I, 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 I think these are just comments that, that we just have to accept as true. Uh, this was an extremely innovative company um, that um, just, just kept on being the best for so long. Any other questions or comments? Uh, reminiscences? Hi, um, this is Miriam Fitzhugh. Um, great to go down memory lane. Um, I, I'll give the women's perspective. Um, I joined I joined DEC out of college in 1977. Um, and I was there till 1994, so 17 years. Um, I am forever grateful to Ken Olson and digital. Um, it made my career in high tech. Um, I'm still working. I'm still in software. Um, it, was, it was an amazing company and it was so equalitarian. Um, I, I, it was revolutionary in that time and uh, definitely a great place for women to work. So thank you. Okay, um, you're welcome. I think I'm still in the meeting. My screen just changed a bit. I'm not sure what happened there. We're, we're seeing a Zoom screen. Um, yes. Hold on, let me see if I can get you. All right, I will say whether we uh, can get to this, the other screen or not is, is if you have comments, all of these, most of the comments, I'm, everything I've been reading from is posted at Maynard Life Outdoors, and that's a place where comments can be left. So if you have some additional thoughts or comments on any of these presentations, I'd, I'd love to see them there, because I, I think that um, the story, um, approaches completeness but doesn't get there and, and can always just be a bit more informed. So again, if, if there's thoughts you had after this or something that you want to go look at what I wrote and, and add a comment there, please do that. I have a quick, uh, hi John McNamara again. I have a quick, a couple of quick little comments about life in the building. One was because of its long history in the woolen business, there was a lot of lanolin on the floors and you had to be real careful going around a corner that your feet wouldn't slip out from underneath you. The other thing had to do with the ceilings above you, which were a long distance up, had been painted white at some point. However, the point paint hadn't quite adhered perfectly. So little flicks of, flecks of white paint would drop on you periodically. And along that same line, when you came back from a vacation, uh, you would find that because of the fluorescent strip lights, that wherever they passed over your desk, there would be a collection of dead bugs across, across your desk from 
bugs that had essentially committed Harry Carey by running into the uh, uh, the light fixtures. That's the end of my comments. I, I will comment on the lanolin because you can read um, some of the experience in a diary from Amy Maynard's sons who said that um, there were times called in to unpack the bales of wool and what they were getting was referred to as, as wool in the raw, which means it hadn't been washed before it bailed up in these 100 to 200 pound bales. So as they're opening up, the bales were all greasy with lanolin, um, smelled of, of sheep urine and, and had bugs and dirt in it. And so the, the building was basically saturated uh, with lanolin and, and, and the wood saturated with that. I, I'm sure if, if you tried to sand something, you, you'd just be zipping along on the lanolin. Uh, and it was just the nature of the building. I worked in building two in the 2000s. Um, and there in our in our office space, there was always lanolin dripping from the ceilings. <laughs> Another feature was the complexity of the building connections. How you would go from the fifth floor of building three to the third floor of building five, you know, through, through one of these uh, connecting bridges. My favorite was over what uh, was called Building One, and it's now called something else. The big long building next to the next to the pond. There's a place there where you can take an elevator, and the elevator it's a freight elevator, and it was illuminated by light coming in from the floors that you were passing. So as you went down past the first floor, the the, the elevator car was momentarily dark because there wasn't any light coming in and suddenly there'd be light from behind you because the door for the next stop was on the other side and that was a tunnel which went underneath uh, one of the other buildings and landed you up in yet another building. You, you went under a, build, under a parking lot, under a building and landed up in the, in the board, what was then the board shop. Uh, so uh, it was really a, a challenge to get from one place to another. And on the deck uh, employee interest list on Facebook, there's a number of uh, stories there from people who got lost. And easy to believe, you, if you don't know the history of the buildings, the buildings date, the existing buildings date from 1857 to 1919. So of course, as they built them and connected them, Floor numbers might not make sense. Um, connections, numbering made no sense. And it, it was just a, 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 a mystery. Uh, and if you didn't have GPS, you, you might get lost. Steve Wagner, you had a, a question there or a comment again. A very quick comments. Old timers will remember in the 70s anyway, John Tobin ran the cafeteria in the mill. Uh, and. Uh, Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, well, that's uh, Tobin Park. The, the tar park around the footbridge is named after him. Any other questions or comments or remembrances? Um, I would like to um, share Roger's comments um, with the audience. So I'll be sending out the link to the recording um, and and some of the chat as well um, that adds adds to the talk. Um, so thank you very much, David. Appreciate it. Um, always a pleasure. Pleasure was mine also. But thank you for an attentive audience. <laughs>